Happy Sabbath, AYC. Question to you. In Australia, do you guys have Adventurers Club? Yes. You have that, okay. Do you have Pathfinder Club? Yes. Okay. So you graduate from Adventurers, I guess you enter into Pathfinders, okay. And after you graduate from Pathfinders, then where do they go? <laughs> well, what club? A nightclub? Where do they go? I think that's the problem. I think we need to have something else. I, th I like to suggest that we should have, all right, Adventures Club, Pathfinder Club, and then an army of youth. What do you say? Amen. Army of youth recruiting young people to serve God at least two or three years. And I like to suggest that no Adventist young man should get married unless he serves his missionary effort. Amen. I didn't hear a strong amen from ladies. <laughs> and I think the ladies should do something very similar. You are not allowed to marry anyone unless you serve God first. Amen. By the way, uh, do we have any full-time workers here today? Full-time workers. Full-time. Can you stand up? Can you stand up? Just stand. Yeah. Do a little exercise. Stand up. Full-time workers. You know, you are... A banker, businessman, um, dentist, doctors, lawyer. Okay, full time workers, full time workers. Okay. Well, praise God for full time workers. Amen? Uh, we need people in the dental office, we need people in the hospital, we need people in business area. So, praise God that you exist in the marketplace where Jesus needs to be introduced. Amen. Thank you. Please sit down. Now, do we have any full-time Bible workers? Can you stand up, please? You know, compared to the full-time workers, the regular workers, I mean, we still praise God for them. But then, now when you look at the full-time Bible workers, I mean, praise God for you guys. Yeah. Praise God. And I know it is, not, it's, it is not about the number. I know that. I know we talk about the, the Gideon's army. But even then, that's still 300. But I know, I understand, God can use with a small number, I understand, but uh, look at this. And not that w people should not be full-time dentist or doctor or businessman or accountant. It's okay. But my friends, if we are going to finish the work, I believe we need more full-time Bible workers. Amen. Praise God. You can sit down. So I have only one thing in mind today. I'm here to recruit. Amen. How many of you are still in school and still thinking about what to do for your life? Raise your hand. How many of you are still praying, asking God to tell you, to let you know, what your life calling is. There are many of you. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the power of God working in our hearts today. Speak to us. To those who are in this auditorium and to those who are 
in the overflow room. Speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's talk about Nehemiah. Yes, we need dentists, doctors, lawyers, accountants, engineers. But in the last days, I believe we need Nehemiahs. Why? Because we need builders. We definitely can use many more builders in the last days. And somehow in our church, we don't have that many builders. We have many inspectors. <laughs> Building inspectors. Not enough temple builders. What, I, what, what do I mean by inspectors? You know how they, at the, uh, when the service is over, after, after the lunch, and when they go home, they, ex, you know, they give their inspection. The sermon wasn't that good today. <laughs> oh, who brought that dish today? That was tasteless. <laughs> how come so-and-so is not doing the work? How come he, how come he became the leader of, of that, 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 that care group? Oh, oh, how come he is not doing his job? Oh, how come he... We became inspectors. <laughs> we became inspectors and not builders. So listen. You have no right to inspect unless you do some building. And Nehemiah, ladies and gentlemen, he's a builder. And we need Nehemiah's in the last days. And by the way, do you know the meaning of this name, Nehemiah? You may want to consider name your child, Nehemiah. Nehemiah means consolation of the Lord. Consolation. Now, what is consolation? What does that mean? It means to sigh, to take pity. I believe, my friends, Nehemiah is a good example of what kind of person we should be in the last days. And let me prove that to you prophetically. Here's how. In the last days, the Bible speaks of only those who receive the seal of God will be saved, will be protected. The mark of God. And the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 9, talks about how how God instructed these angels to go around marking these people that sigh and cry for the abomination that is done in the land. So if I can put it in a really simple way, who shall receive the seal of the living God? Who shall receive the marking of God? That marking is basically saying, you are my people. You are mine. You are mine because you are so much like me. And, and, and in what way you are like me? In what way you have my character? Because you know how to sigh and cry for your people. Many of us, my friends, our Christian experience is so elementary that we only cry for my, our need. We only cry for me, I, and just my things and my family. But ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, if we are going to be builders, my friends, we need to have the spirit of Nehemiah. Who not only had a pity or sigh for his people, but the Bible actually said he was, he was weeping. Let me ask you something. 
It is so easy for you to become inspectors, but when was the last time you actually shed tears? <laughs> Not symbolic tears, literal tears coming down from your eyes because you see so much problem in the church. When was the last time that you actually cried for somebody in the church? If we, if we have not had that experience, we need to grow up in Christ. What do you say? We need to know more Jesus. We need to be more like him. We need to have the spirit of Nehemiah. Oh, my brothers and sisters, it's not about just keeping the seventh day Sabbath holy. It is to have the character of God. And what is the character of God? It's not only love, joy, and peace, but it goes deeper. You cannot have rest until others can truly enjoy the love, joy, peace in God with you. So definitely we can learn from Nehemiah. Learning to have his spirit. And Nehemiah, he came at the right time. Because if you, you already know that his job was, or his, his mission and his vision was to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. But this event was already prophesied in the book of Daniel. So turn your Bibles with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And verse 25. Here we go. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And street shall be built again. And the wall, that's the part when Nehemiah, he, he plays his role. The walls will be built, but the Bible says, and the wall, even in what times? Troublous times. Now that is very interesting. That is very interesting. God called Nehemiah to build a wall, but the Bible prophesies that he has to build a wall during what time? What does that mean? It means, based upon the original language, it means a time of distress, time of anguish. It means there will be trouble. There will be trials. There will be oppositions, rejection. In the midst of all these Things are coming at you, but you have to be strong to build and keep moving until you finish the work. And I believe, my friends, in the last days, a great trouble is coming. Even before the great tribulation, even before probation closes, I believe there will be a great trouble coming to this world but by the grace of God by the promises of Lord Jesus Christ nothing should stop us what do you say Amen. but when we go to the book of Nehemiah we see how these troubles came to Nehemiah Nehemiah chapter 6 Go there with me. Nehemiah chapter 6. Now it came to pass 
Verse one. When Sambalat, who was him? He was a Persian governor of Samaria, high-ranking official. And Tobiah, Samaritan, and Gushem, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies. So Nehemiah, he recognized that these people, in many ways, are enemies. The Bible says, heard that I had what? Built the wall. And that there was no breach left therein. Though at that time, I had not set up the what? Doors upon the gates. How many gates? You know, I tried to count them. I think I counted 12 gates. And the name, of, name for these gates, fish gate, fountain gate, valley gate, um, horse gate, water gate. That's the reason why on your name card you're part of those gates. But um, if you read all of them, some of them are very, uh, very funny name. There's a one gate called Dong Gate. Um, I don't think no, none of you are in the Dong Gate, right? <laughs> um, so you got this Jerusalem. The Bible says the wall is what? Built. But what's missing now? Doors to the gates, right? So are you done with the work, yes or no? Are you, pre are, are you safe? No. So the work is not done. So now Nehemiah is trying to finish the work. So to speak, putting up the gates, putting up the doors. Now, question to you. Those doors, what are they for? What are they for? Oh, to get in? I mean, you have to have a door to get in? I mean, okay, let's see, what, let's see what the Bible has to say about the need for those gates, okay? Here we go. In Nehemiah chapter 7, Nehemiah chapter 7, and verse 3. And the Bible says, And I said unto them, Let not the gates of Jerusalem... Be open until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the what? Doors and bar them. Appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Everyone in his watch. And everyone to be over against his house. So, they need those doors to close them when? Every night. For what? Protect from the enemies. So, you can have the wall, but without the doors, you are not really protected from your enemies. And then, what is the other reason for um, those gates? Nehemiah chapter 13. How do they use those gates, those doors? Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 15. <clears throat> in those days saw I in Judah some trading wine presses on the when? Sabbath. And bringing in sheep and lading asses as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testify against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought what? Fish and all manner of 
where? And sold on the Sabbath. Okay? Unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet he bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the what? Gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gate should be what? Shut. And charge that they should not be open until after the what? Sabbath. So, what was the other practical reason for having those games? That they may keep away the who? The merchants. Keep away the business. Buying and selling on Sabbath. So it was a very practical thing for them to have the gates, to keep these merchants away. So tell me, my friends, according to the story in the book of Nehemiah, what practical purposes do they have for those gates? For protection and keep the Sabbath holy. We may have the knowledge of the truth. We may have the knowledge of the law of God. But the work is not done as long as we don't have these gates, these doors. People, our people are not protected. And we cannot really instruct people in a practical way to keep the Sabbath holy. Oh, my friends, in, in many ways, even though we may have a strong wall, enemies are coming into our gates. The work is not done. We need builders. We need Nehemiahs in the last days. So Nehemiah... He wants to continue to build, to finish the work. But then, he faced this in chapter 6. Go back there with me. Verse 2. The Bible says that Sambalat... Gushem said unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. These men, they want to have what? A meeting with who? Nehemiah. Where? In one of those villages, the place called? Oh, no. <laughs> Funny name, I know. Uh, did they say, hey, Nehemiah, let's go and have a little uh, drinking and dance party? No. They just want to have, um, you know, Casual, I guess, meeting. Just to meet. Just to meet. Anything wrong with that? Anything wrong with that? No. But then the Bible says, but, this is, a, this is what Nehemiah is saying, but they thought to do me what? Harm, mischief. How was, how was it possible that Nehemiah was able to see that? Do you think because he was always suspicious of people? I don't trust you. I don't trust you. You think he was like that? 
He was always suspicious. No, my friends, I believe that Nehemiah knew the, the real intention of these men because Nehemiah was praying man. Holy Spirit impressed in his heart what these men are up to. So if we are going to be builders in the last days, we need to be also building up of our prayer life. Because without receiving the instruction from God, we do not know what to build. So Nehemiah was able to catch that. And how did he respond? Verse 3. And I sent messengers unto them. That's, that seems kind of rude, isn't it? You have all these high, mighty officials came to uh, send a message from them, but then you just send them a messenger. Nehemiah, he does not want to waste any minute of his precious time. If he's doing God's work, nothing is going to distract him. And the Bible says, I send messengers unto them saying, I am doing a what? Great work. So that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? I mean, realistically speaking, uh, what's wrong with uh, one hour meeting with these important people? Don't you want to have a good relationship with your neighboring uh, countries? Uh, oh, Nehemiah, can't you be a little more diplomatic? I'm not saying Nehemiah was rude or he was rough with them. But Nehemiah, in a very, very, in, in meekness and humility, Nehemiah was firm. If I can add a little bit of, you know, Asian touch. I know he's already kind of Asian. But if I can put a little Asian touch, it's more like, oh, I am so sorry. You know, I am so sorry, but I, I need to be busy doing the great work that God has given to me. And smile. <laughs> but in your heart, oh no, I'm not going to, oh no. Nehemiah would not entertain himself just to have these casual chatting meeting with these ungodly men. He is not going to just waste his time socializing with these ungodly men when the work is not done. And my friends, I believe some of us, maybe many of us, We are being easily distracted by useless social relationships with those that have no burden for the things of God. Maybe you're thinking, Brother Gregory, are you saying we should not witness? No. Are you saying we should not mingle with them? No, I'm not saying that. You should mingle with them. You should witness to them. But I'm talking about you just end up doing things, acting, talking, eating, drinking, having just nice fellowship with them, but there is no, there is no building of the kingdom of God with them. I know, I know, I understand. You cannot give Bible study every time you meet your non-Christians. I understand. But when you are in tune with God, you are not going to just drift into useless 
nonsense conversation, social time. And you only have one good intention. I'm trying to win them. I understand you're trying to win them. But the problem is you're only trying. But what happens is, if you don't have a definite reason why you should be there, and you have this very nice motive trying to win them, and you're not really tuned with God, they end up winning you over. And you're thinking you're doing God's work, trying to share a Bible text at a dance club. <laughs> it's really challenging, isn't it? So are you being distracted by worldly relationships? Nehemiah says, I cannot come down. Why? What did he say about his work? I'm doing a what? Great work. And why is it this is great work? Because this belongs to the things of God. How many of you can say, I'm busy doing great work? And what are you busy with? Can you say about what, whatever you're doing and say, this is a great work? Continuing. The Bible says in verse 4, Yet they sent unto me, how many times? Four times after this sort. And I answered them, I answered them after the same mud. Man, they were, they, they were pretty persistent, isn't it? They keep coming back four times. I don't know, that's a lot. I think, I think, uh, humanly speaking, after three, four times, I'll be like, okay, I will see you. You know how we are. If you want to talk to me so bad, okay, I will talk to you. Even after four times, Nehemiah said what? No. Can you say no and still be loving? According to the Bible, yes. And I believe we have to learn that. Don't give in. Stay there. Stay in your good decision. Don't walk away. They, they keep coming back. Keep repeating the same answer. No. Verse 5. Then sent Simbalat, his servant, unto me in like manner the fifth time. Now, but this time, the Bible says, with an open letter in his hand. Now, they're getting pretty aggressive now. Now, they, now, not only are they coming, but they're coming with this open letter. Verse 6, wherein was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu says it, that thou and the Jews think, think, to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, This is a what? King in Judah. And now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, let us take counsel together. Oh, before it's like, Let's just talk, but now, let's take counsel together. Nehemiah, there is this report about you, 
And this report is really negative. And this report can get you in trouble because you are setting yourself as the next king. And this can really hurt you. So let's just talk together and work things out. We are here for you. What is your um, natural um, reaction? And obviously, when you hear the words of Nehemiah, obviously this is what kind of report? False report. False accusation. Now, how, how do you normally respond when you hear false, uh, f- false accusations that comes to you? False report. How do you react? Defend yourself. Defend yourself. When you hear these false accusations, you, you want to do something about it, right? And I don't know about the um, Australians, Caucasians, but Asians, I mean, for us, everything's about preserving your face <laughs> in good reputation. So if there is a false accusation, false report, oh, you do something about it. Who's, what, 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 who is saying what? I'm going to just, I'm going to make it straight. I'm going to meet that person. I, what, that elder? Oh, I'm going to dig up some dirt on him. <laughs> he got me, I'm going to get him. Yeah, yeah, I know who I know what he does. I have seen his Facebook. <laughs> yeah, he thought that he was able to hide those photos. He doesn't know how to use it. <laughs> yeah, I know everything about him. I got him. So what do you do? Trying to protect you. Trying to protect your reputation to save your face. You walk away from the, working, the, the works of God, building the temple, and you're busy, busy bringing about vindication for your character. And Satan says, very good, just, just do that. We need to be like Nehemiah. What did he say? He said in verse 8, Then I sent unto him, saying, There are what? No such things done as thou sayest. But thou, in, in King James it says, Fainest. What word is that? <laughs> Invent. You invented them out of thine own heart this is your invention this is totally false and that's all that I have to say bye I'm back to the work if you want to talk bad about me if you want to make a publication you want to make a video audio um, high definition presentation of all the things about me go right ahead Because I am not here to protect my character, but I'm here to protect the working of the gospel. For the kingdom of God, you may smear me on the wall, but I cannot stop building to finish this wall. I think we should be like Nehemiah. What do you think? So many things can distract us. Number one, just having this um, meeting, social time with the ungodly. Number two, false reports about you. Or it can get worse. False reports about other people. Or even just, it may be true, it may be true. It just the negative reports about other people. Oh, when you hear the negative reports about other people, 
you know, your human nature says, ooh, this is juicy. Yeah. Ooh, I, yeah, I, I knew it, I knew it. Of course I am better than he. Of course, I knew she was like that. Ooh, ooh, tell me more. <laughs> I like this. Tell me more. And then, then we became a professional inspector. And then when we go to the church, we go there as judges. And you have this beautiful angelic wings behind you. And everyone else is just doing things wrong. But you, you're just like a statue of angel. And that's all you do, nothing else. <laughs> do you pray for them? No. Do you go give Bible studies? No. Do you pass out flyers? No. Satan is so clever, he knows how to distract us. So the first one, it didn't work. Hey, let's get together. Just a casual dog, Nehemiah. Let's just have a little meeting. No. Nehemiah, there's a false report about you. Let's do something about this. No. Third time. Look with me, verse 8. Excuse me. Verse 10. Afterward, I came onto the house of Shemai, the son of Del I. Ah. Okay. The son of. Yes, that man. Apology. I'm, I'm, this, I'm this Korean that's having a hard time pronouncing some of these things. God bless you. It says, who was shut up? And he said, let us meet together in the house of God. Oh, that sounds nice, doesn't it? Let's meet together at the church. Oh, okay. Well, what's wrong with that? It's the house of God, right? It's more spiritual, more sacred now. Okay, house of God. Why? Uh, within the temple. And let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay them. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. Say, come, Nehemiah. Come to the temple. This is the most safe place. Why? Because we have doors, these big doors. We can close it, lock it. On top of that, this is the temple of God. God will watch over us. Why? Because the gates, the doors are not set up yet. So at nighttime, guess what? Enemies can still what? Come in. So the most safe place has got to be where? Temple. So to protect yourself, what's wrong? What's wrong with that? Nehemiah said, verse 11, And I said, should such a man as I flee? Let me put that in my lang modern language. Nehemiah says, do you think I'm a man that's going to run away? Let me put it in more direct. Do you think I'm afraid to die? Uh, wait, 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 wait. Come on, Nehemiah. Don't be so, you know, macho hero. I mean, you still have to protect your life. Right? What's wrong with that? Is it, is, is it a sin? No, no, no. It's not a sin to, to survive. But why? Let's continue. The Bible says, um, And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Verse 13. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and what? Sin. 
So, if Nehemiah were to, to hide himself in the temple, that would be a sin. Why? You know why? Because it would give a wrong example. What? Nehemiah? He went into the temple to save himself? Oh, if Nehemiah is scared, we should do something about us too. Then everyone will turn their minds towards self protection. And that will cause another distraction. Nehemiah, let's just have a, just a little chat, just have a meeting. No. Nehemiah, these false accusations, false witnesses, let's do something about it. No. I'm too busy. Nehemiah, save yourself. No. I am not going to do anything that is going to hinder the building of the kingdom. Of God. If I need to die, I will die. People talk bad about me, that's okay. You don't like me because I'm not spending time with you, that's okay. Because I know this is according to God's word, His will. That's Nehemiah. And you may say, oh, he's an antisocial. No. You can still be super social, but super dedicated. Did you know that Nehemiah, in many ways, he was a type of Christ? Did you know that? Yeah, let me show you from the Bible. For, 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 uh, for example, Nehemiah, he... He sighed and he cried for the people in Jerusalem. Yes? Jesus, did he sigh and cry for his people, especially Jerusalem? Yes, he did. And Jesus, like Nehemiah, Jesus was tempted to walk away from his work. What work? What was his main work? His main work? To come? To die on the cross. Jesus came to die. Why? His death was necessary. Listen, his sacrifice was necessary in order to build the church upon the rock. So that was his work, and he, he is completely dedicated, and that's where he's going. And look with me in, in the book of Matthew. Go there with me. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I am here to build this kingdom, and this is my work. But in order for him to build a kingdom, what has to happen to him? Verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter in many ways, chosen leader, Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now get that, Peter rebuking Jesus. 
um, how would you like to rebuke God? <laughs> Peter rebuking Jesus, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Jesus, what are you talking about? Are you talking about you're going, you, you, you're going to Jerusalem to suffer and die? Why are you saying it? Don't, don't, don't go that way, Jesus. Don't do it. Let me counsel you. Let me rebuke you. What are you talking about? You think Peter said it with this sincere heart for his love for Jesus? Yes. But Jesus answered, verse 23, but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You don't understand, Peter. You're speaking things that belongs to men, not things of God. So even his best so-called one of the best disciples try to stop him but Jesus in some sense Jesus saying I cannot come down and there are other discouragements uh, in, in many ways to stop him what look look here in in Matthew chapter 26 Matthew 26 verse 59 now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to... Build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses witness against thee? So the high priest is saying, Look, Jesus, can't you hear these false accusations? Say something. Say something. Defend yourself. But the Bible says, verse 63, but Jesus held his peace. He held his peace. There's no need to explain at that time. No need to go into discussion. No need to explain to them. What would you do if you were Jesus? Would you say, let me give you a study on the book of Daniel. <laughs> Have you heard about 490 years? Would you say it like that? I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong. But if we are not in tune with God, we do not know when to shut our mouths. And went to speak. But at this time, Jesus, he did not need to say anything. Only time that he did spoke to defend the name of the Father. That's said. So Peter tried to counsel him. Jesus says, Peter, you don't know what you're talking about. In fact, Jesus said, Satan. And these religious leaders were trying to provoke him, get him into this theological uh, discussion or some sort to defend his character and his teaching. He has only one thing in mind. I'm here to die. But even then, when Jesus was on the cross, look here, Matthew 27. Matthew 27 and verse 40. When Jesus was on the cross, the Bible says the people around the cross, 
stones. The Bible says, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with, with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Even on the cross, Jesus received these words, these temptations. And obviously, it was not a temptation for Jesus. But the people cried out, You call yourself the Son of God? You call yourself the King of Israel? You are trying to build your kingdom? Well, why don't you come down? We will believe you. We will accept you. And we can work with you to build your kingdom. But all you need to do is to come down. Why do you have to sacrifice yourself like that? You say you have power. You heal many people. You perform many miracles. Why don't you save yourself? Prove, vindicate, show yourself that you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. All you have to do is come down. But Jesus came to build the church, the kingdom of God. And his method of building is to endure the cross. Brothers and sisters, we need to rise and to build. But when we are building, many things will try to divert us or distract us. But the only way we will remain on the wall, keep building, is to endure our own crosses. What is that? Misunderstanding. What is that? False accusations. What is that? You're being provoked to vindicate yourself, to save yourself. Just do something for your life. And sometimes, do something for your life, it's not like an evil thing. I'm not saying it's an evil thing. But sometimes, we drift away just trying to survive. And not caring, not bearing, not dying on the cross of sacrifice. It's okay if we make less money. It's okay if we don't go to the best school. Yes, you can, you can study. You're, with your best effort, that's okay. But your ultimate goal is not, it's not just to survive in this world. It's not just have security and your own protection. It's not. Your first thought should be building the kingdom of God. But this requires the cross. And the question is, what helped Jesus to endure his cross? In Hebrews chapter 12, go there with me. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and, the, and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, 
endure the cross. So according to the Bible, what helped Jesus to endure the cross? What? For the what? Joy. What joy was that? What joy? Do you think the joy was, in three days I will be resurrected? You think that joy was, in few days I'll be in the kingdom of God in heaven? What joy was that, that he was able to see on the cross? As he is making his sacrifice, as he is dying on the cross, what joy did he see? Where else in the Bible do we have a story or teaching that talks about someone who is, who is willing to make a great sacrifice because there is a joy that is waiting for him? Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew 13. Go there quickly with me. My time is ticking away. Matthew chapter 13. By the way, we have time, right? You're all fasting anyhow. <laughs> Matthew 13, verse 44. Are you there? Matthew 13, verse 44, the Bible says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto what? Treasure hid in a film. The which when a man hath found it, he hideth, and for what? joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he has. That's a sacrifice, yes or no? So he is willing to make that sacrifice, selling everything for the joy. What joy was that? Treasure. The joy was, it takes everything that he has to be sacrificed so that he can buy that treasure, that field. And ladies and gentlemen, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, go there quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Yes, and verse 20. Read it. The Bible says, are you there? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For ye are what? Bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. So my friends, we are what? Purchased treasure. Jesus bought us with his sacrifice. And that was a joy. And, and the, to complete this picture, come with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is what? Joy in the presence of the angels of God over how many sinners? One sinner that repents. So let's all put it together. What joy was that that Jesus saw on the cross? As he was enduring the cross, dying on the cross, joy was set before him. That joy, through his sacrifice, through his blood, someone can change and repent and be converted and to be with his father. The joy was not so much because the suffering was so heavy, he was not able to see himself coming out of the tomb victoriously. He felt the rejection. He felt the condemnation. He felt this heavy guilt of the whole world pressing down upon him. And in any moment he can say, uh, the sin of the world is just too much. I don't want this. It feels bad. I cannot even see my father's face. I don't even hear his voice. Where is he? He's not with me. And these people are not with me. And why do I have to go through this? This is too much. And nobody is really appreciating what I'm doing. Because when you go back to Hebrews, go back there quickly. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, verse 3, 
Read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. For consider him that endureth, endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be weary and faint in your mind. Endure what? Contradiction. What is Paul talking about here? Contradiction. He endured the cross. Think about it. He is dying on the cross. He feels rejection from God. But he's enduring the cross. Why? He wants to save these people. Basically, he is doing something very special for these people. But these people, they don't appreciate what Christ is doing. In fact, they hate him for it. They said, we will be happier if you come down. But Jesus is like, I cannot come down. I cannot come down. You're more important than me. If I come down, you'll die. And I'm doing this especially for you. But even though you don't appreciate me right now, I will endure this until the end. Even though no one appreciates what I'm doing to build my build a kingdom of God. I will continue. No one likes me. No one supports me. No one appreciates me. In fact, they hate me for it. It's okay. Because at the end, I'm praying that those that don't appreciate what I do, but because I am surrendering my life to God that they may see Jesus on my face and they will repent and join the building of the kingdom of God. So brothers and sisters, we need Nehemiah's. Willing to take the ridicule mockery, even the threat of death. He only has one thing in mind. God's work comes first. Can you do this as dentists, doctors, businessmen, accountant? Yes. But I want to challenge you. How many of you are willing to say, God, help me to be a committed, self-sacrificing builder for the kingdom of God in the last days. If you do, stand where you are. Now I want to recruit from you. Since you're standing, you are saying you want to be a builder for the kingdom of God in the last days. Now I want to invite you in a tangible way, in a real way, do something. If the Lord is impressing you, to give your time and trust me it's not a sacrifice it's a privilege give your time to God six months to three years six months to three years doing God's work 
Yes, you can go back to your regular jobs. That's okay. Again, we need God's people in the marketplace. But we need more full-time builders. Do you understand? So if you can, no, you can through the grace of God. I want to invite you. Who is willing to make a decision today? I want to give my my time six months to three years doing God's work full time. Bible work, call porter. Maybe graphic designer, editing. I don't know whatever it may be. Doing God's work. Three, six months to three years. And I will put, a, I will set aside my marriage plan, my 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 career goals, even my education. God comes first. Who cares? I make lots of money. That's not the most important thing. We have too many people building the wall of IBM. We have too many people building the wall of hospitals, and we need these things, amen. But we need people to build the wall of the gospel kingdom. So, how many of you are willing to say, "Lord, help me to give six months to three years"? To do God's work. If you do, please come to the front at this time. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Come. Please stand right here. And I want you guys to line up like an army. And you can line behind them. This is a recruitment. Anyone else? Six months to three years. Give yourself to God. I know you're saying. Oh, what about my mortgage, my car payment? Oh, what about my this and that? Oh, I, yeah, you are fancy slave. That's who we are. We're trying to secure ourselves. We're trying to survive. We became expensive slaves in this world. So we are just bound to these things. But, but I see miracles happening. In my friend's life, they're in bondage and debt, obligations, this and that. But listen, do not be afraid, because your boss is God. Okay, your earthly boss may fire you, but God will not fire you. He will give you the fire of the Holy Spirit in you. So who else? Who else? Willing to say, Lord. I'm willing, six months to three years in the work of God. I want to give my time. Please come to the front at this time. Who else? Now I want to make a special appeal. There are those. And I'm especially speaking to young men. You know the Lord is calling you to become a full-time, into full-time ministry. This is your life calling. And the Lord has been speaking to you. God bless you, sister. The Lord has been speaking to your heart. Just forget about what you're doing, and just get involved. In full-time ministry, whether it is pastoring, Bible teacher, call porter, whatever may whatever may be, the Lord is calling you to do full-time. I don't know if we have that many, but I want to give you the opportunity to make that decision today. If you do, please come down at this time and stand right here. Anyone? 
God bless you. Anyone? The Lord is calling. Anyone else? God bless you, brother. God bless you. Anyone else? That God can use us. Out of millions, God will finish the work, to be. not because of us, you know in spite of us. God bless you. Anyone else? Full time. And those that are watching in the overflow, if the Lord is calling you. To do six months to three years of ministry, please come. Come to this auditorium. We will wait for you. Don't worry. Walk fast. But come and join with these young people. If the Lord is calling you for full time ministry, please come and stand with these young men. Yes, even young ladies can be a full time. Bob Worker, amen. So God is calling, please. Now is the time. Yes, it's a smart thing to plan your future for security. I understand. But give God your heart, your best right now. And let God take care of your house, car, your monthly need, let God take care of that. Amen. But make your decision now. Come. God bless you. God bless you, brother. Anyone else? Any young ladies? God is calling you to be a full time in the ministry of God. Please come to the front. And last night, Brother Randy Skeet made a call for baptism and rebaptism. And I know there were people last night who ignored that call or it just came today. And I want to give you this opportunity to make your decision for baptism or rebaptism. You can feel the prompting of God. Come at this time and stay on this side, please. God bless you, brother. Anyone else for baptism or rebaptism? Come to the front. God bless you. Don't make your decision tomorrow. Make your decision today. Don't put it off. We do not know what tomorrow may bring. Come, make your decision. Any baptism, any rebaptism, come at this time. Anyone else? For a short time ministry or a full time ministry, come to the front, make your decision. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I know you're still out there. God bless you. God bless you, sister. Anyone else?
please come. I believe all these people are ready to wait for you. They're all fasting for you. They're praying right now. Is what you're doing? God bless you, sister. God bless you, sister. What more to look for in this world? How much more money can you make? Yes, thank God for money. We can use them for our needs and for good cause. But really, my friends, heaven is waiting for us. Kingdom of God is coming. Let's build the kingdom of gospel. The gospel of this kingdom. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. Let's come. And I know you have to sacrifice something when you come up here. You know, I think some of us, like Zacchaeus, oh, before his conversion, the moment before his conversion, I think many of us are like Zacchaeus. When Zacchaeus heard that Jesus is coming, he climbed a tree and looking Jesus from distance. I mean, if I can call it, that's the way he attended the outdoor moving AYC. And Zacchaeus was thinking, I just, I'm just curious. I'm just curious who this man is. He's so popular, and so I, want, I just want to see, his, see him and, and to be able to, to see his face. So, but when he came to the meeting, there's so many tall, spiritual people. And because of that, he had a hard time seeing Jesus. So he climbed this tree, and he was thinking, I just quietly just sit here and look at Jesus from little distance just to satisfy my curiosity and on top of that all those people they don't like me anyhow I don't really fit in this AYC camp this conference but then Jesus stopped the whole whole conference in the middle of his sermon so to speak he looked up Zagius he called him by his name maybe he got scared who, who told you about me Zagius what are you doing up there come down quickly I want to abide in your house today in that moment Zacchaeus felt this overwhelming love acceptance and hope for his future and he came down quickly and if I can put it in today's language Zacchaeus said to Jesus Jesus I was just you know curious and I just want to see who you are and but the way you treated me and how much you love me how much you accept me you really changed me and because of your love I'm willing to change <laughs> I don't care about money anymore because I used to hate the fact that people don't like me and I hated myself but you you love me so much I'm willing to make any sacrifice with joy and Jesus helped me also to be part of a builder I will do whatever 
any Zacchaeus here today he just came here to just observe but you felt the love of Christ and Jesus is calling you not just to become an observer but a builder to be part of his kingdom so any Zacchaeus out there my last call come down quickly come down quickly anyone from the overflow room come quickly and make your decision for God you can come down while the singer is singing God bless you person we all going to close our eyes okay and when we pray and you can just quietly come up if you can and make your decision all right Are you coming down? We see you now. God bless you, man. God bless you. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, What are we building in this world? What building instruments are we using? What building materials are we using? Father, we see all these building materials for the kingdom of God but they're just sitting there doing nothing and it seems as though no one wants to make that sacrifice and start building the kingdom and yet we complain that no one is doing the work forgive us wash away our sin help me O oh God help us O oh God that nothing else will consume our mind but only one thing and that is to lift the cross of Jesus so high that all may see Jesus and be saved as you are building our character help us O oh Lord humbly and meekly help us to give up anything and everything to build the kingdom of God because you gave so much for us even when we hated you you still loved us 
Thank you. Use us according to your will. We ask in Jesus' name.